Boa, boa tarde a todos. Hoje recebemos o professor é, Christian Pfeiffer. O professor Christian Pfeiffer trabalha no Centro de Tecnologia Espacial Aplicada e Microgravidade, na Universidade de Bremen, Alemanha. Good afternoon. Today we receive the professor Christian Pfeiffer from the University of Bremen, Germany. Most specifically, he works at the Center of Applied Space Technology and the Microgravity. Well, Chris, uh, Professor Christian Pfeiffer will talk about space-time symmetry in teleparallel gravity. Professor Mr. Pfeiffer, we would like to thank you by presentation in our school today. Professor Christian Pfeiffer, be my guest. Yes, thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you for the um, for the uh, for the invitation. I hope you can hear me and see my slides, and I hope uh, you see my cursor. I will today talk about space-time symmetries and teleparallel gravity, and if I have enough time, I will also talk about black hole solutions in teleparallel gravity. Uh, so let us start right away to give you a little overview of my talk. I will first introduce um, something you may have already heard uh, today. Um, namely what, how, how we describe the geometry of a manifold in terms of teleparallel geometry, and then I define how symmetries are implemented in this teleparallel geometry. Afterwards, I will discuss ex uh, explicitly how we uh, construct axial symmetric solution, which shall, um, or axial symmetric geometries, which shall describe rotating black holes and rotating astrophysical objects. Um, then I discuss spherical symmetric geometries, which we use as prototype for the axial symmetric ones. Um, for these, it's way simpler to find solutions because in the axial symmetric case, it's really difficult to find solutions in um, teleparallel gravity. And I will also talk a little bit about homogeneous and isotropic um, teleparallel geometries, which we can use to describe cosmology. And then I give a little summary of this first part of my talk. The second part of my talk will be about spherically symmetric black hole solutions in F of TB, teleparallel gravity. And we will discuss a perturbative solution and the phenomenology for what we call the real tetrad and an exact solution for the complex tetrad before, in the end, I come to conclusion and outlook and we will have some time for questions and discussion. So let's start right away with what is teleparallel geometry and how do we implement symmetries? So um, the geometric fields I uh, use to describe teleparallel gravity and teleparallel geometry is a tetrad and an independent flat and metric compatible connection. So a tetrad is nothing but uh, a one form or tetrads are basis one forms, which can be expressed in local coordinates in a manifold like this. So I, uh, on a four dimensional manifold, I have four of these. These are uh, the components of the tetrad are 16 field components and they possess an inverse so that I can talk about the tetrad and what we call a dual tetrad. So in this inverse, uh, the, the matrix components of the inverse and the tetrad itself satisfy this inverse relation. The metric is a derived object in this, uh, uh, in this context and you obtain a space-time metric or the components, the coordinate components of the space-time metric by a contraction um, by, by the contraction of the tetrad components with the Minkowski metric, where the Minkowski metric is the diagonal metric with entries minus one, plus, 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 or if you prefer the other signature, plus, minus, minus, minus. In addition, we have an independent flat and metric compatible connection um, where the affine connection coefficients can be expressed in terms of the tetrads and uh, the inverse tetrads or cotetrads um, by this formula, where we have an additional spin connection here, where we call uh, these objects here, these, um, yeah, these omegas, are the so-called spin connection coefficients, and they will help us to write down this uh, flat and metric compatible connection in a very convenient way in a moment. So, in general, connections are characterized by their properties with respect to ter parallel transport, they can have curvature, non-metricity, or torsion. Curvature tells you if I parallelly transport a vector around a loop, um, the deviation from the vector from its original um, position. 
Non-metricity of a connection tells you when I have a certain vector parallelly transport along a curve, how the length of this curve, uh, of this vector changes along the curve. And torsion tells you something about um, mutual parallel transport of vectors among, along each other. If I um, parallelly transport the first vector along the red uh, vector field, and then uh, the uh, along the black one, and then the black one along the red, I end up at a certain position, and I could can do the same in the opposite um, opposite order. And then the question is, if this parallelogram closes, and this is measured by the torsion. The most famous and usually used um, connection is one which has only curvature and no non is metric compatible, so no non metricity and no torsion. That is the Levi Civita connection. And the Levi Civita connection coefficients are constructed from the metric. And this is a geometry uh, in which general relativity is formulated historically and which we usually use to describe gravity. Teleparallel geometry now, as I said, is a geometry of space time which has a flat and metric compatible spin connection. Uh, connection. So we have no curvature, we have no non-metricity, but we have torsion. And this one can show when one solves these conditions that the spin connection coefficients, which appear here, which define the um, affine connection coefficients, must be given by Lorentz matrices um, in this form. So these lambda are just Lorentz transformations, local Lorentz transformations. And uh, combining them in this way, using this connection, one can show that these connection coefficients have vanishing torsion. Uh, vanishing curvature and vanishing non-metricity. So these are the connections we will work with. Um, so the geometric fields, just to sum up, are tetrads and Lorentz transformations which generate a spin connection with torsion. Then um, when we have tetrads, we know that we get the same metric um, if we choose one tetrad or another tetrad which is generated from the original one by Lorentz transformations. And these affine connection coefficients um, and the metric are invariant under such Lorentz transformations. What does it mean? So we have an original tetrad, which we map to another tetrad, um, which is rotated from the original one by Lorentz transformation. The co-tetrad transforms inversely. And then I can introduce yet another Lorentz transformation. So I transform these spin connection generating Lorentz transformations. And then I find that the objects which are introduced on the last slide, the metric, the um, affine connection coefficients and the torsion that they are invariant under this transformation. Now, one can choose this Lorentz transformation in a very specific way. Namely, um, I can choose that this uh, transformation here, lambda, um, or this lambda is ex exactly given by um, the lambdas which generate my original spin connection. When I do this and I study the transformation behavior of the spin connection coefficients, then I find that in this new frame, um, the spin connection, this object here, is exactly zero. Then in this frame, the affine connection reduces just to this expression and the torsion to this expression, the anti-symmetric part of this expression. And without loss of generality, this means we can always work in a frame where I choose, I, mean, I said the geometric fields are the um, tetrads and the Lorentz transformations. I can choose a pair of uh, tetrads and uh, Lorentz transformations to be the identity, which we call a Weizenberg gauge. In this gauge, the spin connection coefficients vanish. And this is uh, the gauge in which I will usually do all, uh, all calculations. So now we have set up the stage for um, teleparallel geometry and we can ask ourselves, what is the symmetry of such a geometry? And the answer will be the following. So here I just recall uh, the, the settings, so the geometric fields, and uh, we are working very often in Weizenberg gauge, but not immediately. So let us think about what is the symmetry of a manifold. So we have our manifold, and on the manifold, we have the metric, which is constructed from the tetrads, and we have these affine connection coefficients. Then we are looking at a mapping, which maps the metric, uh, which maps the manifold um, to the manifold and which encodes an action of a Lie group, to be more precise. And these uh, mappings, uh, I, can, I can have a look and what happens uh, to my geometric objects under such mappings. Yeah? They, um, these mappings act on, uh, on my geometric structure. And then um, we call such a mapping, oh, sorry, this should be large phi's, sorry about that. Um, 
We call such a mapping a symmetry if the geometric structures, so here the metric and this uh, independent connection, are um, the, the are invariant under the action of such a diffeomorphism, such a mapping from the manifold to itself. And infinitesimal, we can study such diffeomorphisms, such mappings uh, encoded into a into a local vector field, and from this we can derive the killing equations. So we can say, oh, I'm really, really sorry about the different phi's appearing here. They should all be the same. Um, we can say that uh, a diffeomorphism, which is generated by a vector field X on space time, is a symmetry if and only if the lead derivative of the metric vanishes. This is what you know from metric space time geometry already. And uh, one can also study what does the lead how does the lead derivative act on the, on the affine connect connection coefficients. And you will find this expression. And if this is zero, then we say um, that this vector field X generates a symmetry of space time. Now, uh, OK, th this is for a general connection. Here you see curvature appearing and the torsion. In the teleparallel case, we are looking at a um, connection without curvature. This is what I said already. So now, how does this look in teleparallel variables? Now we talked about the metric and this affine connection. In teleparallel variables, we said that we are looking at the tetrad and the spin connection. We can play the same game. We just must study how these diffeomorphisms act on our teleparallel variables. Um, so this conditions on the left-hand side here, the action on the metric and the action on the affine connection coefficients, they're independent of any Lorentz frame. So there is a certain freedom um, in, in how these... Uh, how these diffeomorphisms act on our teleparallel variables, which depend on the Lorentz uh, frame we are choosing. And uh, this freedom can be accounted or can be encoded by mapping these, uh, uh, yeah, by, 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 by taking into account that these transformations which we uh, have here um, can be mapped into an element of the Lorentz algebra. And then uh, our, our lead derivatives of the teleparallel objects are only determined or fixed up to, um, or oh, here this piece too much, up to a compatible local Lorentz transformation. And this looks like this. So if um, the metric satisfies that the lead derivative of the metric vanishes and the um, affine connection coefficients uh, satisfy that the lead derivative, um, that the lead derivative vanishes, then the tetrad, uh, the lead derivative of the tetrad is determined up to a, a compatible Lorentz transformation and the lead derivative of the spin connection coefficients is also determined in terms of these compatible Lorentz transformations. Now, what happens if we look into Weizenberg gauge? In Weizenberg gauge, our, uh, our spin connection coefficients vanish, which means that the um, lead derivative uh, equation, the symmetry condition for the spin connection coefficients are satisfied if and only if we find um, Lie algebra homomorphisms from our symmetry group on space time, and I will make this more precise in the examples, into the Lorentz algebra, which are constant matrices, which are represented by co constant Lorentz transformations. Uh, Lorentz algebra elements, sorry. OK, and from this also follows, if, if, if a teleparallel geometry satisfies these two conditions here, then we also know that the torsion itself is invariant under these transformations. So this already sums up the summary of how I am uh, how I implement um, symmetries on a teleparallel geometry. So the generalizations of the uh, killing equation um, from from metric geometry to teleparallel geometry is exactly this one here. And this is now what we want to solve for several situations in the next slides. So let us start with axial symmetry. So uh, just a reminder, we want to solve this teleparallel killing equation in the Weizenberg gauge um, for our geometric fields. So let's start with axial symmetry. Axial symmetry is described by having one killing vector field, which describes uh, rotations around the preferred spatial axis. So our group symmetry, which we want to implement on space-time, is given by SU2. The uh, corresponding Lie algebra is a small SU2. And we have one killing vector field. Yeah, We have one symmetry vector field, which describes rotations around the phi axis, for example. And then what one finds, I can implement, I can embed this uh, vector field into the SO2, uh, into uh, the SO13 algebra via two different Lie algebra homomorphisms, by this non-trivial one and by the identity. 
And these two different embeddings will lead to two different axially symmetric teleparallel geometries. So I can plug this uh, into the Killing equations and solve them. This is a lengthy calculation. I will not bore you with all the details. I will just show you the result. Uh, you can find the details in the paper uh, which I um, cite here, which I uh, developed all of this with my collaborators, Manuel Hohmann, Laura Yerf, Martin Krizak, Sebastian Bahamonde, um, and Jorge Gigante Valsarel. So um, the general axial symmetric tetraps in teleparallel gravity take this form, where these coefficient functions here are general coefficient functions depending on the time coordinate, the radial coordinate, and the theta coordinate. So we use um, uh, we use kind of spherical coordinates on space-time to do this derivation. And we find one tetrad, which has a very specific dependence on phi, which solves uh, the killing equation. And we find another tetrad, which is independent of phi. These both tetrads, in general, describe uh, uh, independent branches. Um, independent branches of axial symmetric teleparallel geometry. To both, um, we associate a vanishing spin connection since we solve our teleparallel killing equations for a vanishing spin connection. And we see that these lambdas, so these embeddings of the SO2 algebra into the SO3 algebra, actually, they are constant. They do not depend on the space-time coordinates. Um, so when I want, when you calculate the metric um, from these uh, tetrads, you find that it's a mess. It has all components, and we know that we can still apply some coordinate transformations to make them simpler and to obtain the standard um, axial symmetric metric we know from uh, Kerr geometry, for example. To do that, um, we can set some of these functions to zero. And what we find is that uh, these two tetrads give us the standard axial symmetric metric, where we have a dt component, a dr component, a d theta component, a d phi component and as only off-diagonal term, the d, d phi dt component. These are basically mimicking general generalizations of the Kerr class of axial symmetric um, geometries in general relativity. We have done this analysis for the whole plebansky demiansky class, but I present you only this one, since this is the one most known and most useful. Now, having identified the geometry, we can ask ourselves, does, uh, do we find solutions to, teleparallel, um, to a teleparallel theory of gravity? And the class, uh, oh, oh, yeah, sorry, so just to summarize, and the class, what we are looking at are the so-called FTB phi x gravity. So what we have is we have a Lagrangian, um, which is a function of the tetrad, which is considered as a function of the tetrad, um, which depends on a general function of the torsion scalar, which defines the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity, the boundary term, which is a, marks exactly the difference between the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity and um, the usual Einstein-Hilbert action. Then we introduce a scalar field and, uh, and the kinetic term of a scalar field. And uh, we can derive the field equations for the tetrad uh, by variation from this action. And we can, when we do the variation of the action with respect to the um, tetrad components, we get an equation which has a lower index, a, lo a lower Lorentz index A and a space-time coordinate index sigma. We can uh, lower the index sigma and transform the um, Lorentz index to a space-time index to get the field equations with two lower indices. And then what one does in teleparallel gravity, one splits the field equations in symmetric and anti-symmetric part. And before we focus on the symmetric part, which are sourced by a possible energy momentum tensor, we look at the anti-symmetric part. And very often in the literature, you find that tetrads which solve the anti-symmetric field equations are called good tetrads. I would simply say we are first approaching, so we need to solve all of the field equations and let us start with the anti-symmetric ones. And what one finds for this whole class of theories, and that's why we consider this a large class because we can study them all at once, that this, the only non-vanishing anti-symmetric field equation takes this form for both tetrads, we have some part which depends on the on this general function f, so on the Lagrangian, and the derivatives of this function f with respect to t and theta, or, or the b and theta, or t and r and b and r. And we have some part which depends only on the um, on the functions on the components of the tetrads c. Uh, so they are theory independent. 
And now when we look for solutions, we can basically look at four options. We can look for universal solutions which are independent of the function, so they work for any function if we just solve qr equals zero and q theta equals zero. We can look at qi equals zero and uh, that this bracket here vanishes. Oh, no, sorry, this bracket here. We can do the opposite. We can look at q theta equals zero and ask that this bracket vanishes. Or we can look at the case that none of these terms vanishes separately. And what kind of solutions do we find? So this simple case one finds a simple constraint which relates these uh, tetrad components, these remaining tetrad components here to each other. Um, and the observation is if we impose this constraint, we cannot turn this metric into any of the known axial symmetric solutions of general relativity as metrics. So one either gets something that resembles Kerr, the top nut solution, or for example, the C metric. That's why we looked at the more complicated situation. And here we find solutions which can be interpreted as teleparallel connection to the top nut geometry. Furthermore, when you look at this uh, solution, we find, uh, in, we find some solutions um, which have no uh, direct limit to spherical symmetry. So they are a bit the, um, the uh, one cannot turn off the rotation of these solutions in some sense. And uh, so for these, um, we didn't find a very good physical interpretation. Last but not least, the most complicated curse, um, that includes the curve geometry and teleparallel connections to the curve geometry. However, these equations are very, very complicated to solve. And we are still studying um, them to find a proper teleparallel um, generalization of the curve solution. And all details on this analysis of this FTB phi x gravity can be found in this paper, while the, uh, the study of, this, um, of the general axial symmetry can be found in this paper. Well, having discussed um, axial symmetry, let us continue with spherical symmetry and play the same game again. So now our symmetry algebra is a bit larger because our symmetry group is the one of spatial rotations. So instead of one symmetry generator, we have uh, three ge symmetry generators which form the SO3 algebra. Again, we must map these into the, um, into the Lorentz algebra. And there is only one homomorphism which does this, which I displayed here. And this, again, are, the, um, are all ingredients we need to solve the teleparallel killing equation, which gives us um, this most general spherically symmetric tetrad in the Weizenberg gauge. Uh, so it consists of six um, free functions, which can depend on T and R. And we have a very specific and fixed dependence on theta and phi, which is what you expect in spherical symmetry. And the metric you obtain from this tetrad is given by this expression. So you have the dt and dr component, you have the usual angular uh, metric, and you have a cross term which can be eliminated by coordinate choice. Um, again, we can look for spherical symmetric solutions in um, FTB phi x gravity. And here I will also only consider the anti-symmetric equations. So we play the same game again and find that two um, of the three, uh, two, that only two, that this time two anti-symmetric field equations are not automatically solved and they take this form. So we could solve them by setting, um, um, by setting these terms to zero or the sum of them to zero. But this would just um, bring us back to theories of gravity, which are the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity, or would be equivalent to f of r theories. So the more interesting choice is to set one of these, a uh, uh, combination of these um, metric coefficients to zero. And we can look at four different branches. The first one is we set c3 to zero and c6 to zero. By a coordinate choice, as I said, we can always bring this term to zero, and this is we choose C2 to be zero. And then C5 can be uh, identified with, uh, can be proportional to the, to the radial coordinate times some psi, because here C5 squared appears. Um, we can choose here plus or minus one to get the first branch of, um, of, of tetrads in FTB phi x gravity, which solves the anti-symmetric field equations. Um, 
This xi, this the sign, the choice of sign here will be important later. We'll see that this have really influ uh, uh, has a has an impact on comparison of um, of observables with uh, with solutions of this theory uh, in solutions of this theory. So the other branch is setting c1 and c5 to zero, and uh, we do a coordinate choice to eliminate the dtdr term again and set c4 to zero. And this time we can choose c6 to be plus minus r. Observe that here this tetrad now is complex, and this is complex in order to preserve the um, signature of the metric. And both of these classes of tetrads, so we here have two tetrads, and here we have two real tetrads and two complex tetrads, um, lead to uh, the standard spherically symmetric uh, metric of this form, where I now chose the signature plus minus 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 for convenience, since this is always start, often done in um, in the literature on teleparallel gravity. And we will revisit these solutions later when we study um, black hole solutions in FTB phi x gravity. So last but not least, from the interesting symmetries in, um, in the application to physics is homogeneous and isotropic symmetry to describe cosmology. And we can play the game again. We want to solve the teleparallel killing equation now for a symmetry algebra, which consists of the three rotations and the three quasi-translations, um, which give us the maximally symmetric uh, spatial slices, which are either flat um, Euclidean space um, or a sphere or a saddle, where this uh, parameter chi here is the usual uh, parameter, uh, is the usual function depending on the spatial curvature of the uh, spatial slices of space-time. And, um, sorry. There is some Skype interfering. I will quit that quickly. Um, so, where, where, uh, yeah, this depends on the on the curvature of the spatial slices of space time, and we'll introduce u as square root of this k. Since this will appear in the two branches of solutions of the Killing equations we find now, um, namely this first one and the second one, and we see that they are also potentially complex depending on which. Um, depending on the sign of the spatial curvature of space uh, of, of, of the spatial slices of space-time. However, uh, with both of these tetrads, one can analyze uh, the expansion of the universe and solve modified Friedman equations and study cosmological perturbation theory, as um, it was, for example, presented uh, by uh, Manuel Ruhmann in several papers. And for both tetrads, again, we get the standard friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric um, here, uh, still with the coordinate freedom of setting this lapse function uh, to one. An important point is now we could again ask what happens if we study um, the anti-symmetric field equations, let's say in FTB phi x gravity. In this homogeneous and isotropic symmetric case, when you study the anti-symmetric field equations of any teleparallel theory of gravity, you find that they always vanish for this choice of tetrad. The reason simply is that um, there exists no anti-symmetric 0-2 tensor, which is symmetric, um, which is homogeneous and isotropic, except the one which vanishes. That means, since all of our geometric fields and all of our theory is homogeneous and isotropic when we choose these tetrads and the vanishing spin connection, for any teleparallel theory of gravity you would like to study, these tetrads solve the anti-symmetric field equations. So they are, in a sense, really universal. But this only holds in this highly symmetric case. OK, now um, I've presented to you um, how to study symmetry in terms of teleparallel geometry. And let me summarize the findings here before we move on to the next, um, to the next topic of this talk. So we studied the geometric fields, the tetrad and the spin connection, or the tetrad and the uh, spin connection generating Lorentz transformation. We considered a Weizenberg gauge and solved the teleparallel killing equation for axial symmetry, where we found independent of the theory two different branches. We uh, found the spherically symmetric tetrad, which is only one branch, but in, uh, when you want to solve the anti-symmetric field equations, you find, for example, in FTB phi x gravity, at least four branches. And we found the general homogeneous and isotropic tetrad describing um, friedman lemaitre robertson walker uh, universe or space-time, um, where we found that for any teleparallel theory of gravity, both of these, these two branches, solve all the anti-symmetric field equations you could ever get. 
Now, can we relate these two branches? Because what we could do, for example, we could take a tetrad, this tetrad here in axial symmetry or the first tetrad here in homogeneous and isotropic symmetry with, to which we associated a uh, um, vanishing spin connection. We could apply a Lorentz transformation such that we obtain the second tetrad mutually. And then we would have the second tetrad, but we would associate a non-vanishing spin connection to this second tetrad. Since, as I uh, told you in the beginning, the, the Lorentz transformation, in order to have invariance of the connection coefficients and the torsion tensor, we need to do a transformation of the tetrad and simultaneously of the spin connection coefficients. The same um, I could do the other way around. I could start with the second tetrad and do a transformation to the first, where I, in the beginning, consider the pair of variables second tetrad with vanishing spin connection, and then I obtain first tetrad with non-vanishing spin connection. Now, in the covariant approach to teleparallel gravity, these two tetrads, these two set of variables, so tetrad spin connection or tetrad Lorentz transformation and tetrad spin connection or tetrad Lorentz transformation, they are equivalent. They describe the same physics, the same for the second branch. However, these branches one and two, they describe physical different situations. So this one and this one or this one and this one, they describe physical um, different branches where I can look for solutions. This just as little comment how these different tetrads here are related in the covariant approach to teleparallel gravity. Okay. I hope I'm not too fast. Let us go on and discuss black holes in F of TB gravity. Um, and just recently with my colleagues, uh, Ale uh, Sebastian Bahamonde, Alexei Golovnev, and Maria Jose Guzman, and Jackson Levy Said, we published a paper on spherically symmetric solutions which can be interpreted as black holes in FTB gravity. Let us recall the solutions to the anti-symmetric field equations. So what is missing? We still have some free functions in these tetrads, which all lead uh, to these kind of metrics. We want to determine the metric coefficients from the symmetric field equations. We already ensured by this choice of tetrad that the anti-symmetric field equations are solved. So let us start with this, what we call the real tetrad. For obvious reasons, it's real. Um, so to solve the, spheric, uh, the, the um, symmetric field equations in spherical symmetry, they take this form. Don't be scared by them. I just want to flash them very quickly to you. Um, solving them can be done with the help of Mathematica in certain situations or other computer algebra programs or computer programs. Um, so we have three uh, independent, uh, we have three field equations. The fourth one, which you get in spherical symmetry, is directly related to the third one. We have two independent metric components, which we need to determine. So the system can only be solved if um, two of these, uh, if, if one of this equation can be obtained by the means of the other two. And this is the case due to the symmetry. We can use the first two equations to um, generate the third one. So we can really solve this system. And this is simply due to the spherical symmetry. Um, so, and the first kind of solutions I want to look at is perturbations around Schwarzschild geometry. So to really look at FTB corrections to Schwarzschild geometry. And for that, I fix the Lagrangian to the following form. So we look at the quadratic correction in the torsion, tens uh, torsion scalar, a quadratic correction in the um, boundary term, and a product between the two. And we label them with different coupling constants, alpha, beta, and gamma. And now I want to plug this into the field equations and determine this little a and little b here, which give me the corrections to first order in this parameter epsilon here um, to Schwarzschild geometry. And this can be done. I will show you the um, solutions in a moment in terms of this parameter mu. So we call this variable 1 minus 2m over r, um, we call mu. And then the solution of A, uh, of the small a of R, contains two integration constants, A0 and A1, and a mass of terms. Among them, this logarithmic term here, which always causes a lot of trouble in calculations. Similarly, we get an expression for the B of R. Don't look at them too long in too much detail. You can uh, study them in the paper for all detail if you like. I just want to remark here that the important thing is to determine now these constants, A0 and A1, by two um, physical conditions. We want that this A of R and B of R, that this space time, is compatible with describing a black hole. And therefore, we want 
uh, we fix these integration constants such that the product of A times B when we approach the horizon is constant. This ensures that the determinant of the metric is well defined at the horizon. If it would diverge there or go to zero, then we would lose uh, the interpretation of a proper defined space time at the horizon. And this we need to assure, and this one can do by fixing uh, one of these integration constants. The second integration constants can be fixed by studying the asymptotic behavior. Let's say we want a solution here or a correction which is close to Schwarzschild geometry in the weak field limit, so far away from our source. And we can um, study the asymptotic behavior of the B, for example. And then we can fix this A1 exactly in such a way that for R going to infinity, the leading order term is exactly as the leading order term in Schwarzschild geometry. Yes. And in this way, we can fix these integration constants and really get a complete solution. Um, so the solutions A and B, they are now functions from our parameters of the theory, alpha, beta, gamma, and this parameter xi, which parameterizes the two different possible branches um, of this uh, real tetrad. We said that xi can be one or minus one. And the interpretation of this xi or the impact of this choice of this um, parameter xi can best be demonstrated if we look at some physical observables in spherical symmetry, which we can study and which we can measure. For example, the photon sphere. The photon sphere is, are the um, cir unstable circular photon orbits around a black hole, which are in general relativity in Schwarzschild geometry just lies at the radius of three uh, times the mass or three half the Schwarzschild radius, and they will now get a correction. The second interesting observable is the famous perihelion shift, which was so nicely predicted by general relativity for Mercury. Um, now we want to look at the corrections. And to study the corrections to the perihelion shift, you look at an at a, at a, at a orbit around a black hole or a central mass. Um, and you, you, you know that uh, the, the orbits of massive uh, objects around a black hole or a central object, that the perihelion of these, they, that, that shifts. And uh, here we study orbits which are close to a circular orbits and parameterize this perihelion shift, these corrections, in terms of the, uh, this um, perturbed circular orbit. And I exaggerated the drawing here that you can see what happens here. And in general relativity, you get this result here. Oops. Um, this result here, and we will see that we get corrections from our teleparallel geometry. Another observable is the deflection of light. So we have a light ray passing by a central object. Without a central object, it would just be a straight line. But with help of the central object or the central object, gravitating object, um, causes the light ray to bend. This is just gravitational lensing. And again, we can uh, look at corrections to the general relativistic case. So how do these corrections look like? So uh, this correction here uh, depends on all uh, to the to the photon uh, orbits to the circular photon orbits depends on all of the parameters of our theory and um, is independent of this sine parameter psi so one can calculate these this uh, photon sphere also characterizes to first order the shadow of a black hole or what is known as the shadow of black hole so observations of the shadow of a black hole could be, uh, give us some constraint on these parameters the perihelion shift now, we get corrections to the different orders in the small parameter L here. And we get, uh, and these corrections all depend on the parameter Xi. Yeah? And we see that if Xi is chosen to be minus one, the correction to Schwarzschild geometry in this observable is minimized because it only come here at, at third order. Yeah? So the, the, the tetrad with Xi equal plus one is in this sense observationally preferred. And the same we see in the light deflection. And when we derive the, the formula for the light deflection, we again see the dependence on these parameters alpha, beta, and gamma, but most importantly, the one here on psi. And here to first order, um, you only see a correction which comes from this uh, horizon boundary condition here. So um, this psi dependence, as I said, um, can be uh, can be interpreted. And the impact of this parameter psi can be directly interpreted from uh, deriving these classical observables in spherical symmetry for the classical tests of general relativity. And we see that this deviation is the deviation from Schwarzschild geometry is minimized um, for the same theory by uh, choosing the real tetrad with psi equal to plus one. 
So in this sense, one could say, if one finds deviations from general relativity, they are most likely to be small, and the um, Xi equal one tetrad is in this sense observationally fa favored. Okay, this is about the uh, perturbative results on the real tetrad. Let me go on with the um, exact solutions which we found. So these were just perturbative solutions and I only presented to you perturbative solutions because we were not able to find exact solutions with a good physical interpretation for the real tetrad. Now let's look at this complex tetrad. And when we plug this tetrad into the field equations, um, we find a tremendously simplified uh, equations. Um, they still look quite kind of messy, but they are way more compact and way more simple than the ones for the complex tet uh, for the real tetrad. And more importantly, or more interestingly, we find that they are independent of this sign parameter, which we had here also, xi, uh, uh, chi here. Yeah? So, so if I choose uh, chi equal plus or minus one, does not matter for any observable, um, which I construct from the metric, um, since in the determination of this uh, parameter of the metric functions a and b, this parameter chi doesn't play a role. Um, for the ge uh, in, ge in general, for a general FTB gravity, this, uh, these equations cannot be solved, but we can uh, choose a very uh, famous model, which was studied in the literature a lot, which is uh, FTB gravity, uh, which is f of t gravity, um, with this form where we have a square root, um, one plus two times the torsion scalar divided by alpha, um, which is, has been named teleparallel born inside gravity, which was studied in the context of um, of cosmology, of inflation, and um, also some nice interior black hole solutions uh, have been found um, for such uh, theory. We can also study this perturbatively, but um, in this case, we are lucky and we can really find non-perturbative solutions. And the metric we get is, uh, and the solution we find is characterized by these two metric functions, um, which are not precisely the inverse of each other, but um, uh, yeah, but but contain uh, 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 the same factor, but with different prefactors. So this is, uh, to our knowledge, the first non-perturbative spherically symmetric solution uh, that is found in f of t gravity. You see that it's rather complicated with this tangent to the minus one here. Um, we need to fix the uh, integration constant a1. You see here integration constants again appearing a1 and a0. Um, to uh, ensure asymptotic flat behavior of this metric. And um, also, if we want uh, not only asymptotic flat behavior, but behavior like Schwarzschild geometry um, in, the small alpha, uh, in the large alpha limit, when we do a power series expansion in terms of alpha here, we see that we should get just general relativity. And to ensure this, we need to fix the second integration constant in this form. And when we analyze, uh, so we didn't analyze yet the full um, phenomenology of this uh, uh, solution, but we plotted the vanishing of the GTT component, basically where we expect the horizon. And what you see that um, depending on the value of lambda, one can get arbitrarily close to the Schwarzschild solution. And the larger this coupling constant, la or the smaller or lambda, lambda should be alpha, I'm sorry, um, some renaming. So this, this uh, theory parameter alpha is called lambda here. The smaller it is, the stronger is the influence of the teleparallel correction. And this already brings me to my conclusion. I was way faster than I expected. Um, so we discussed uh, the geometric fields in teleparallel gravity and how they um, are subject, how we can define a generalized killing equations or teleparallel killing equations for these teleparallel variables in Weizenberg gauge. Then we found the most general Weizenberg um, gauge tetrads in axial, spherical, and cosmological symmetry. We found in axial symmetry two branches, as well as in cosmological symmetry, two branches independent of the theory. We looked for solutions to the anti-symmetric field equations in FTB phi x gravity. In axial symmetry, we found these many branches and many possible ways to find solutions. In spherical symmetry, we found these four branches. And in cosmological symmetry, um, I argued that the field equations are always solved for these uh, cosmological tetrads um, for any teleparallel theory of gravity. Uh, then we studied solutions to symmetric field equations in FTB gravity and spherical symmetry. And 
what this also shows that we found so many solutions that there is no Birkhoff theorem in um, in uh, in FTB gravity. So always multiple spherically symmetric solutions exist. And uh, the phenomenology, so the uh, the phenomenology must decide about the physical viability of this different solution. So we need to study um, the classical tests of general relativity and compare them with observations, for example, with the shadows of black holes or the perihelion shift of the stars orbiting the center of our galaxy. And this is uh, this further um, phenomenological analysis of this symmetric uh, solution is already uh, still work in progress and also the search for um, axially symmetric solutions, um, which are corrections to the cur uh, which are teleparallel generalizations of curve geometry is work in progress. And with this, I like to thank you for your attention. And in the end, I have prepared a little bibliography, incomplete bibliography for you. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Christian Pfeiffer, by your uh, nice presentation. Yes, we would like a uh, red thing. Well, now we open the section, the session for questions. Professor Christian, one question from one student that is watching the presentation is the following. He asked for, for you if he, you analyzed it, that the Laurent symmetry is, is broken because they introducing the gauge fields in this, in this aspect. Introducing the what, please? Sorry. The gauge, the gauge fields. The gauge fields. Um, yes. yes. So, um, as I said, this is maybe best explained uh, on the slide on the different branches. Um, Laurent symmetry is not. Uh, broken in the sense we, we fix this Weizenberg gauge for doing all the calculations. Um, but we can also solve these equations, the killing equations in any other gauge. Because when we change the gauge, when we apply a Lorentz transformation, what we just need to do, we cannot interpret the new tetrad also with vanishing spin connection, but we can either take the tetrad which solved the um, teleparallel killing equations with vanishing spin connection, this is what we solve. If we apply a Lorentz transformation to the tetrad, we simply get another tetrad which has a non-vanishing spin connection. And then this pair of tetrad with non-vanishing spin connection is equally good um, and has the same physical properties as this original tetrad with vanishing spin connection. What I cannot do, which really would change and break uh, a Lorentz invariance, is take this new tetrad, but take the old spin connection yeah, this is then so this is a different situation than this one. We have this taking this tetra two, for example, with this spin connection is equivalent, and this is what I understand under Lorentz invariance, to taking the original tetra with vanishing spin connection. It is something different in taking this new tetra with vanishing spin connection. And that because this one is not obtained by a Lorentz transformation from this. Yeah? even though they are related by Lorentz transformation. So this physical situation, taking this pair, is equivalent to taking this pair. And you can take any Lorentz transformation here, and you must not arrive from this tetra to this tetra, but you can arrive at any tetra you like. Just always take into account the spin connection. Then you're on the safe side. And in this sense, the theory is perfectly Lorentz invariant in a simultaneous uh, transformation of the tetra and the spin connection. Okay, Professor Christian, it's a very nice uh, uh, answer. Well, we don't uh, have, we haven't uh, more questions and uh, we will like again because your presentation is a nice presentation and uh, we hope they uh, receive you in another, another opportunities here presentially, okay? Yes, it would be great to visit you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Ciao. Well.